Sometime late last August, a friend of mine who's very wise and smart, who lives in LA, called me and she said, did you know you're gonna get sprayed with pesticides in Santa Cruz? And I was like, no, that can't be true. But my friend is very wise and smart and she was right. Monterey got sprayed twice, Santa Cruz got sprayed once, and here I've been thinking in the Bay Area, we live in the People's Republic of Ecotopia, but it turns out instead we live in Mordor. I'm just going to give a brief overview of the facts for those who are new to the issue. This spray program, which is being conducted by the California Department of Food and Agriculture, so if you hear people throw around the acronym CDFA, that's who is being referred to, began in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties last fall uh, and is coming to the Bay Area in August of 2008. The portions of the 8th Bay Area that are affected according to CDFA's current spray map are all of San Francisco, Southeast Marin County, and all of the East Bay from the Carquinez Bridge all the way down our side of the hills, including the hills, so that includes Tilden and Wildcat and so on, to the southern border of Oakland. So you may have seen lists of cities that omit certain cities, but in fact all of the cities and unincorporated areas in that portion of the East Bay are included. The program is aimed at the light brown apple moth, which is billed as a voracious pest by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. There's 3.1 million people that live in the spray zones that are where this light brown apple moth has been found. There are about 300,000 probably that have been sprayed so far. So this, the, these problems, there's a lot of potential suffering here, a lot of potential harm that can be caused by this. I was checking out plants. I'm an herbalist by profession and trade, and uh, I was checking out plants down in the slough. And I was flabbergasted at, at what I saw just as I walked literally uh, 10, 15 yards off the trail. And in an area that was about as long as this table, with all these tables put together here, there were 29 dead cormorants just all laying there, just dead. And um, the, which may not seem strange to many people, but when you looked at this, this was, uh, they were all in pristine shape, meaning that um, that all died around the same time. Well, they sprayed us on September 10th uh, in Pacific Grove, where I live, a beautiful place, neighboring Monterey and Carmel and Pebble Beach. And I'm able to work at home quite a bit, so I worked at home that morning from 7 to 12, and then I thought I'll go to Jamba Juice down in Alvarado Street. And the moment I went outside, for 5, 10 minutes, I was sick. There's a surfactant ingredient, uh, tricapital methyl ammonium chloride, that's in the formula being sprayed. Uh, so first they said these birds were covered with the surfactant, some of them. Uh, then they said, oh no, the death of these birds were attributable to red tide. Well, we go back to the animal rescue people and we say, you know, is this consistent with red tide? She says, we've been dealing with red tide for 25 years. The most number of birds that we've ever seen with red tide is 30. And she says, in the first three days, ex immediately following the spray, we had 248 injured or dead birds submitted to us. It's a fairly famous example because it was in the Monterey paper, but uh, this man is an Air Force major, and he's at the Postgraduate School in Monterey. The irony is that he puts his life on the line as a pilot to protect people against governmental abuses of power, and yet his family was sprayed with something that proved toxic to his 11-month-old son. He wrote, beginning on Tuesday, September 11th, our 11-month-old son developed what we thought was a simple cold. It progressively became worse to the point where he had labor breathing, severe congestion, and loss of appetite. He also seemed to act groggy and delirious. We brought him to the Monterey County Emergency Room on Friday. He was admitted for the weekend for all patrol, respiration therapy, and steroid cocktail drinks. Our boy has always been healthy. He was discharged Monday, so he was there for a couple days. Two weeks later, he wrote, my son unfortunately has had a bad relapse. This time they transferred him to a Stanford-affiliated hospital in San Jose. Anyway, the kid's condition ended up being re reactive airway disease, which is a lot like asthma. He had never had this day in his life that developed after the uh, spring, the day after the spring started. They say that the birds have died from other things and that this temporal association is coincidental. They don't even think twice about the bees. You get it? I hope you really hear it, because they're coming here. If we don't stop it, they're coming here. 
As far as the red tide that Paulina just asked me about, the uh, red tide is a normal occurrence that happens, and sometimes it's partly due to climate change, it's partly due to pollution, it's partly due to a lot of things. Um, five days after the spray, we had a red tide in Santa Cruz at the time, the week before the spray. We know this because we went to Surf Ride, which is a foundation in Santa Cruz. And these guys were surfing through this red tide, you know, week before. It was no problem. They're used to, they've been surfing in it for 25, 30 years, too. Um, literally two to three days after the spray, we had the most vicious red tide that anybody's ever seen in 30 years, including fish and wildlife, the county fish and wildlife. And again, we go back and look at the chemicals that are in the aerial spray formula that's being used, and four of them feed red tide plankton, which then will lead to death of crabs and, and uh, mollusks and salamanders and different, different of the aquatic ecology, which then the otters and the seals and the sea lions all feed off of. So it goes right down the chain. Sometimes entire families would get sick with similar symptoms on the same day. Lots of people got sick, but they didn't think like, oh yeah, I had that weird sore throat for a week after the spring, or I've had these bizarre lymph plants, swollen lymph plants. They don't make the connection. You're dealing with anecdotal stuff, and the county health department should be dealing with this, but they're not set up to do it. And that's been a big foo in Santa Cruz, that the county health department didn't send out the notification forms, no doctor, healthcare provider, or clinic in Santa Cruz was given these forms. And so then when they say it's anecdotal, well, guess what? The reporting mechanism wasn't in place. Well, what about the bees? So what about the bees? She says, I was gardening on Wednesday, and it was a bright, sunshiny day, and my rosemary was filled with bees. On Thursday, um, I'm gardening, everything's fine. Friday, I'm gardening again. Nice day, not a single bee to, to be found. You know, I'd just like to comment on the bees, too, because I saw a report recently that talked about the bees and, and possible effects, and one of the observations was the plastic capsules can be about the same size as pollen. So there's a question about whether or not the bees will innocently take this back and make a food store out of these plastic capsules and then perhaps either get poisoned from that over time or starve to death over the winter. So. Um, symptoms included swollen glands, <coughs> rashes up to covering half of the body, fatigue, intestinal pain, chest pain, headaches, dizziness, uh, eye irritation, throat irritation, bronchial irritation, kind of a range of symptoms. But when you read about the inert ingredients, they're kind of consistent with what's in there. There are other moths being attracted to these traps and caught. What about them? They throw the pheromone out in their environment. They're not going to mate. You know, maybe these are key species that you know, feed our coho. We have a program that's based on lies and deception and doublespeak. And I think you've all read that. Oh, it couldn't possibly be the checkmate that made them sick. It was a seasonal allergy or possibly just a regular cold. We know that wasn't true. This, is, this checkmate or pheromones have been used for 10 years over populations. Nobody's ever gotten sick. Another lie. It's never been sprayed over large populations. Um, the protocol of uh, spraying pheromones over urban populations is without precedent, precedent and is experimental in its application completely. The pesticides that are being used are being used in what's called an off-label manner. They weren't originally approved for aerial spraying. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency granted an exemption for them to be used in this way. The pesticides themselves are made up of three components. The main ingredient, or the active ingredient, which is the ingredient that targets the pest, is a synthetic moth pheromone, that is a moth sex hormone, that's designed to confuse the moth's mating pattern. Uh, this substance has not been subjected to any long-term human exposure testing, has never been applied aerially over urban areas, this specific pheromone. The second ingredient in the pesticide are so-called inert ingredients. That's uh, U.S. EPA lingo for ingredients that don't directly target the pest, but they're not inert in the dictionary sen sense of inert doing nothing. These are actually known to us and have been tested. There are at least 10 of those that are listed on that nice chart over there that John prepared. Uh, and we know that among those are known carcinogens, mutagens, which means they cause, cause cell mutation, reproductive effectors, liver toxins, dermal irritants, and substances that are not supposed to be inhaled. 
The third component of the spray is the microscopic plastic capsules in which the spray is issued. These range in size from 10 to 190 or 300 microns, depending on who you listen to. There's a nice photograph of one on that chart. Those pose an unknown inhalation risk. They had not been tested at all to those who are exposed to the spray, but anyone exposed to the spray will be breathing them. Things of 10 micro, size, size 10 microns or smaller, once inhaled into the deep lung, which they can reach at that size, cannot be expelled. The capsules are a time-release product, so after the pesticide is sprayed, they slowly release it over a 30-day period, at which point then the CDFA sprays again. So the exposure is ongoing. It's not simply the time during the spray. There'll be the chemical will be released into the environment uh, for the 30 days following. The purpose of the pheromones is to dis disrupt the mating cycle or the behavior of the male moths to actually just make them unable to find the female. The female emits a pheromone plume from it, her her body, and this pheromone is very that they're dumping into the air is to confuse the male moths from finding these females. And if you look at the consensus health document that's on the CDFA website that was prepared by the California Department of Pesticide Regulation and the Cal EPA Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, um, often called OEHA, you'll see that they very clearly state in their own document that this is the first instance of this product being used over populated areas. Previously, it's only been used aerially over agricultural areas. As of today, there's no reported quantifiable damage to any plant caused by the light brown apple moth. We have respected entomologists from the UC system saying, given the range over which the light brown apple moth has been found, it has likely been in the state for as much as a decade. Ag secretaries, ag commissioners in the counties report no, absolutely no damage large populations of other leaf roller moths in California for which we don't treat, which are kept in check by natural predators. One of the problems with the eradication program is that the National Marine, uh, the National Marine Sanctuary is imposing buffers near the, the shorelines and in river and corridors where the spray cannot be applied over open water because of its implications in the water and aquatic invertebrates. But the National Marine Sanctuary has um, has prevented any spraying within a, a 100 meters of, of any open water uh, along the ocean. And because of this, this will allow LBAM populations to be maintained. They're going to live there. There's no way they can spray in there. They can't get in there. So the population could never be eliminated in those zones. It will always be found to affect. They'll be coming out of those zones and reoccupying these areas. Pesticide that's being sprayed is manufactured by a company in Oregon called Sutera. It's owned by a gentleman named Stuart Resnick, and if those of you who uh, read the excellent article in the Berkeley Daily Planet this week noticed uh, buried way down in the article the information that Mr. Resnick is a big political donor and has given $144,000 to Governor Schwarzenegger's campaign. There's a proposal uh, for CDFA also to use uh, trichogamid wasps. Uh, I was afraid of this uh, technology when they first presented it, uh, but um, to their, their credit, they are actually thinking of using native trichogamid wasps, which uh, is probably a, a, a better part of the solution. But don't forget, these trichogamid wasps are going to be looking for places to lay their eggs. And hopefully, they'll be in the egg masses and the larvae of LBAM. But what about the other 30 to 50 species of tortricid moss that will be atta under attack by over a million trichogamid wasps per acre? But I'll tell you what I believe. I believe that the California ag industry, specifically grape growers, and throughout the United States, needed a pest. They needed a pest. So they had to go out and find a pest. And they found a pest that wasn't even a pest. And they found it so they could stop Australia and New Zealand from bringing produce into this country and grapes into this country that would compete with their business. And so they started the big lie. We don't even know if it needs to be, if any action at all is needed. The first option you consider in IPM is no action. Is action required? We've not only taken action, we've skipped over all the first 20 possibilities, which are the least disruptive to the environment, which is a fundamental principle of IPM. And we've gone straight to what I like to call the nuclear warfare by launching planes. CDFA has chosen aerial spray as the first resort against a pest whose risk has not even been assessed. The only real threat LBAM poses 
is its imposition caused by USDA-mandated quarantine to not tolerate this pest coming out of New Zealand. It really is a trade pest. It's a way of closing the door on products that come from areas that have this pest. And I really don't believe there's any, uh, any warranted um, emergency here for any aerial plant spraying uh, anywhere. And this was before they actually sprayed. You're going to hear this a lot. History tells us, agency, time after time, we have emergencies we must eradicate. You're going to hear things like, the science says that we have to do this. The science says we must do this. You're going to hear things like, we have to do this for agriculture. It's us versus them. You're going to hear these things play out time and time again. They've already played out on this issue. They're saying, well, if we don't get rid of this pest, then people won't take our produce because they can't actually go back and say, oh, well, you know, really it was an economic decision. A study that came out just this last year in Environmental Health Perspectives, one of the foremost environmental health magazines, uh, noted that many of these pesticides are still found in people's blood today. That blood, that's even passed on to children, the mothers that were exposed to it then, it's being passed on to their children, and they have a disproportionately high likelihood of developing breast cancer. And yet, years later, here in California, some of you might remember this or played a role in it in the 1980s and then through 1990s, the state decided to control pests by spraying malathion overhead for something called the Mediterranean fruit fly. At that time, we were told it was an emergency. It's an emergency, it's such an emergency we have to get rid of, we have to eradicate this pest. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Not that many years ago. The same thing then. The same thing played out with something called the glassy wing sharpshooter. Some of you might have heard about this, more in Sonoma County. We have to get rid of it. It's, we have to eradicate it. It's an emergency. It can destroy all of California agriculture. We have to get rid of this pest, the glassy wing sharpshooter. The same thing has played out time and time again. Whether it's for trade or whether it's for agency dollars, whether it's for research money. In all of these cases, it is an emergency. It has to be eradicated. Uh, I've been information gathering from, from day one and really have a good perspective on the biology of this insect and what it can really do. The two previous people who have spoken, there's enough reason there not to do any spraying. But when you look at the science and the lack of science that's behind the protocols they're using and using this pheromone, mating disruption pheromone, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, uh, over urban populations to eradicate a pest that may not be much of a pest. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very disconcerting that we're all in, invo being involved in a grand experiment that has no basis or evidence that it's going to work. I want to just talk to you about what it actually is and how the program that's being pursued here by the state is really not integrated pest management, though you will hear it called that in the press. Integrated pest management is an approach to managing pests in agriculture, in residential settings, in buildings that's fundamentally based on the precautionary principle. If you're involved in environmental issues, you've probably heard of the precautionary principle, which in essence says, if we don't know whether something is safe or not, if we don't have all the cause and effect data, but we have good reason to suspect there may be risk, we take precautions, we don't proceed. We don't actually play with people's health if we're not sure what the outcome is going to be. Moreover, and most fundamentally, the precautionary principle says the burden of proof for the safety of a proposed action is on the proponent of the action. We've already seen the evidence and we've done the science ourselves. The evidence is 643 people have adverse health effects. The science says these particles are this size. The science says that we can inhale them and they'll get stuck in our lungs or that we can't digest them in the first place. The science says that there are inert ingredients that have not been tested on our health and could pose threats to our health and the environment. If this was an NSF project that I was applying for and it involved one human subject, I'd have to write volumes of paper on that individual's health status before, during, and after whatever I was proposing to do. Nobody signed any waivers of being involved in this study. I mean, they're building litigants, actually. 
The Clean Water Act was changed under this current EPA, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, made some revisions uh, to the Clean Water Act such that aerial spraying and then it's damage posed by runoff into waterways and water bodies, which used to be the grounds for opposing aerial spraying applications, is no longer valid. So that are sort of the teeth of what would normally be our legal approach about filing something under the Clean Water Act is no longer available. I think the fundamental issue here, Steve Lyle, who's the, um, the PR guy for the, the CDFA, said in the Oakland Tribune yesterday, environmentalists want this. This is a pheromone product. Environmentalists want pheromone products, perhaps in safe sticky traps, perhaps in select ground applications. I don't think any environmental group is advocating aerial spray of a pheromone product with inert ingredients in it and plastic microcapsules over an urban area. That's really a misrepresentation of the environment. So you find a lot of people who actually receive money from CDFA or USDA, like researchers in the University of California, they're really hesitant to speak out. Even though they're not doing work on light brown apple moth, it's what CDFA could do to them, to their funding, to their, their all the people who are hired with their money. So, we're finding a lot of resistance of people speaking out. CDFA themselves says there's been no reported crop damage associated with the moth. We've heard from Dan we have large populations of other leaf roller moths in California for which we don't treat, which are kept in check by natural predators. It's a minor pest in New Zealand. Given all those things, why is the first thing the state has done is declare a state of emergency? And by the way, that was declared by the CDFA, not by the governor. It's an administrative emergency. And then started flying planes over homes and schools and populated urban areas to eradicate a pest. And we don't even know if it needs to be, if any action at all is needed. There are no known studies or reports on the effectiveness of using pheromones as an eradication tool, as CDFA is proposing. They've never been used to eradicate anything. They're only used to control. And um, there's no basis to conclude that when CDFA finishes spraying in the county, there's no precedent at all that it's actually going to work. These products we know next to nothing about. We haven't seen anything about it. The city of Albany's not going to put up with it. I don't think any city around here is going to put up. So we need to write to all of our legislatures, write to the exterminator, write twice and tell him that you won't put up with it, because really he's the one that's going to have to stop this. The two people in California that can stop this spray are the governor and the secretary of agriculture. The LBAM Act of 2007, it was passed, I think, in two months in the same year. So we were in a meeting with um, John Laird's staff, actually, and my colleague uh, Isabel, who's in the back there manning the tables, um, asked a, a very reasonable question. You, could, they had just finished explaining to us, well, you know, just realize anything we take on, you won't be able to have until next year. She asked the question, well, how did you get your law in the same year? How did you get your law, the LBAM Act, proposed and passed in the same year when you tell us we have to wait a full another year? And the answer was, well, that one had an urgency clause. <laughs> an urgency clause? We want an urgency clause. Yeah, if you get thrown, you go to a bar and you make somebody mad next to you and they, they throw your drink on you, you can charge them with assault. These are people flying over airplanes and spraying stuff that doesn't have a composition that we all know uh, can harm us or not. Realtors now have to declare that houses are in the spray zone. So think of the loss of property values. Think of the loss of tourist dollars and business travel to the Bay Area. So you can make an economic argument that the spraying is going to cost the state more than that so-called agricultural threat is going to cost. My name is John Russo. I'm with StopTheSpray.org. And I have the online petition to help uh, put us back in the driver's seat. Mayor Weaver, who's sitting to my left, who's going to speak next, who's my mayor, has uh, 
as a nurse, figured out pretty quickly that this was a bad idea and has really taken a vigorous stand on this issue and is encouraging all the local governments in the spray zone to pass resolutions opposing the spray as an effective means of, of presenting a united front to Sacramento and also is encouraging people to talk to state and federal legislators to ask them not only to stop the spray, but this fundamental change. We can't keep spraying people in order to protect agribusiness and crops. There needs to be a change in philosophy. You know, I actually think it's immoral. <coughs> the things that I've heard coming out of these government <laughs> you know, saying we have good science. They don't have any good science. I haven't seen any good scientists. In fact, I, I believe our uh, secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture has a degree in comparative literature, a BA. <laughs> What farmer would ever go out in their garden, find a, a larva of an insect, and say, oh, oh God, I've got to spray the whole thing to get rid of that insect, even though I haven't noticed any chewing on the leaves or it hasn't affected one fruit? I mean, what bad farming practices? A lot of potential suffering here, a lot of potential harm that can be caused by this. None of us want this apple moth to decimate California agriculture. More and more exotic invasives are going to continue to arrive here. We cannot spray for every new bug. It's not feasible. We're destroying ourselves in the process of trying to keep pests out. I think we need to put people before plants, children before produce, public health before business interests. Um, and we need to insist that our governor, in particular, and state, unelected state bureaucrats who have so much power you can't believe they can actually design and, and implement a campaign like this, and they don't represent anybody. They're, state, they're bureaucrats, unelected officials. We need to make sure that their power is checked. We have to put out policies that protect our health and the environment. Yes, we should control these insects as much as possible, but control means doing things safely and effectively. has agreed to be the pass-through for any donations you make. We have court costs, we have bumper stickers, we have photocopying, so we can really use your money. Thank you.